What movie or series lit your fuse and made you have to tell stories on screen? The first time I truly remember feeling weightless during a musical number was seeing Under the Sea in The Little Mermaid. I was on a play date, so I was, I was not with my family and I just couldn't believe what I'd seen. Uh, a Calypso number that defied gravity. It just like, it, it really blew my mind. Went back with my parents, made my sister take me. Uh, called in sick from school the day it came out on VHS so I could, because I couldn't wait till the end of the school day, just pretended I had a fever. I'd grown up listening to musicals and loving musicals. My parents were a cast album couple. They, on their first date, they both realized they had the Man of La Mancha cast album and they saw that as a sign that they were uh, soulmates. Um, so I, I grew up with that, with memorizing cast albums and music that told stories, and that one felt like the first one that was mine. I, uh, I just, um, it felt contemporary to me, and it just felt, I just couldn't believe I was seeing a singing crab. Like, it just like nothing about it made sense. <laughs> and, and I just thought, oh, you can go anywhere. You can write a song about anything. Um, that's how unlikely it felt to me. I, I think the two, big musicals that got me here talking to you um, were my first Broadway musical, which I saw when I was seven years old. We didn't have money for Broadway. It was always a special occasion thing, like, like most people. Um, but we saw Les Miserables when I was seven. I fell asleep. I remember crying when Fantine died. Took a look, like laughing at lovely ladies, even though the joke sailed over my head. Um, and then, I remember Confrontation, which was two people singing in counterpoint and that being like amazing to me. But what I remember the most was my parents bringing home the two disc CD and my mother crying every time she heard Bring Him Home. And I think the fact that I saw how much musical theater moved my parents, I wanted to move people like that. Um, but again, I never thought about writing musicals because they always took place in some other time, some other land, the ones I, was lucky enough to see on Broadway the three of the 80s were Phantom Cats and Les Mis. I mean, Cats literally takes place in another universe. And the other two took place in France in some other century. And then I started falling in love with performing in musicals in junior high and high school. Um, and then Rent came out right when I needed it, when I was 16, 17 years old. I saw it as a birthday present in the last row of the mezzanine. Um, and that's when I went from wanting to be in musicals to having permission to write musicals because it was the first truly contemporary musical I had ever seen. Remember, Chorus Line's a period piece by 1996, uh, even though that was contemporary for its time. Um, and uh, it, just, it just blew my mind. And I, the cast was so diverse. Um, I, I, sort of everything about it was the blueprint uh, for what I would try to make and expand upon when I started writing musicals. On your way up, what movie or series did you watch that was so good it made you question if you could ever rise to that level? I think any musical theatre writer will tell you that the work of Stephen Sondheim uh, humbles you. Uh, he's so good. Uh, his lyrics uh, and his music are expanded the terrain of what musicals could be. Not even like they're good musicals, <laughs> they're good musicals, um, but they expanded the notion of what an evening at, in a, at a piece of musical theater could be. To spend 90 to 100 minutes in the company of presidential assassins and find what makes them tick and what rots at the heart of the American dream to spend two hours and change with a homicidal barber with revenge on his mind. Um, and uh, they all have totally different musical styles and they're all Stephen Sondheim musicals. One of the great joys of my life is that I'm friends with John Weidman, who is the librettist for Assassins, and I called him about two years into writing Hamilton, after which I had two songs to show for it, because I was drowning in research. 
And I just said, man, can I buy you a drink? Because I'm paralyzed by the amount of work that's out there about these characters that I have to somehow fit into an evening. Uh, and he gave me the best piece of advice. And it, and it came from Assassins, which was originally they were going to do Assassins throughout history. And they realized there's no through line there. It's tough to tie Brutus uh, to John Wilkes Booth. Uh, and then they said, okay, so let's make it American Assassins. And then they winnowed and winnowed and compressed until they could find the through line. All this to say, he said, stop trying to get it all. There's no such thing. Just start writing the songs that made you think this was a good idea. Um, and so I followed that advice and what happened was Hamilton started forming its own spine. I started writing, what are the musical numbers that have to be in my version of Hamilton? I need to see, I need to see Eliza and Hamilton fall in love. I need to write about the affair. I need to write about these cabinet rap battles because that was one of the initial impulses I had when I was reading Ron's book. Um, and the first public presentation of it was 11 songs that were all over. The, they were not linear. They were, it was My Shot, it was Right Hand Man, it was a cut song called Valley Forge, um, Angelica didn't exist yet. Um, I hadn't written, I hadn't figured out Burr yet, so I hadn't written Wait For It yet. Um, we closed with the opening number, um, but it was just, I was following John Weidman's advice, like don't, you can't get it all. Write what you wanna write. And that forms it, that tells you in turn uh, what you're working towards. Um, so to have a distinctive style and yet expand in the, to the terrain of whatever world you're working in, um, I think we all, I think everyone after Sondheim is either responding to or emulating or some combination of both. Whether it was your own work or approval from someone who mattered to you, what first gave you the confidence that you belonged? I have to, I would have to flash back to sophomore year of college at Wesleyan. Um, I, when I was five years old, I got into Hunter College Elementary School, which is a, uh, even now still overwhelmingly white institution, even though it is a public school and it is a school where, you know, you take a test and that determines whether you get in. Um, so I was always Lynn at home and uh, Lynn at school and Lin Manuel at home. I was speaking Spanish at home and English at school and I was, living the dual identity that most first-generation kids whose parents grew up speaking Spanish, um, they, they understand that. But I wasn't, the friends I was making at school didn't have that same shared experience. Um, and it wasn't until I got to Wesleyan and lived in this program house called La Casa that was sort of for us. It was, it was quote unquote for Latino campus leaders. Um, I was the, the, the theater kid, um, but there were I remember living with Alejandra, who uh, helped to unionize the janitors at our school. I remember, uh, you know, uh, living with Liana Amayes, who went on to become an incredible lawyer. Um, but what we shared was we all had the sort of hyphenated childhood of Spanish at home, English at school, Latino culture, American culture. And I think that's when that started to go into my writing. I was still imitating Jonathan Larson up to that point, and there was nothing really distinctive about my writing until I said, oh, I have to bring all of myself into the room. I have to bring the Latin music that I grew up with. I have to bring the hip hop music I grew up with. Um, and if Jonathan, and he stated this very explicitly, Jonathan Larson's mission was to write the hair of the 80s, to write um, to end the conversation as to whether rock and roll and pop music and Broadway music can coexist, I sort of took it upon myself to say, and hip hop exists here, and Latin music exists here, and they can coexist peacefully because my favorite music is storytelling music, no matter what the genre. And I think living with those kids and having that shared experience gave me permission to access all of myself. What was the biggest obstacle you overcame that allowed you to turn the projects that influenced you into your own language. The obstacle is always getting people to see the vision that you have. Um, the vision for In the Heights wasn't a lot more complex than um, it's been 50 years since West Side Story. We can be more than gang members from the 50s in a musical. Um, some of the impulse of writing that was out of necessity. Uh, you have to remember like The Cape Man came out when I was a senior in high school 
and it's still gang members from the 1950s. Like, what an overrepresented subset of Latinos, those poor kids in New York in the 50s. Um, and so those sort of twin things, the West Side Story and Kate Man together kind of were like, they were like a wake up call from musical theater being like, no one's gonna write your dream show. Like, no, like you're gonna play a gang member from the 50s unless you write something, you write your way out of that. Um, and the obstacle was, the obstacle is always finding collaborators who believe in your vision and make, help you make it better. Um, and that, I, I was very lucky in an early ally with Tommy Kale with that. And then that came to its ultimate fruition when Kiara uh, came on board to write the libretto because she was writing about her neighborhood in Northern Philly with the same love and attention that I was writing about my neighborhood in Northern Manhattan. Um, and we realized these would, this would be great. And she really focused the storyline, made it about the neighborhood, um, and made it about the changing of, of the neighborhood as, as New York is always changing um, and Washington Heights was particularly changing. Um, and then finding producers who believed in that. We met with producers who said, where's the drugs? Where's the crime? Um, and I really have to give Tommy credit because I would leave those meetings with real producers who would produce things, but were selling me back West Side Story. Um, and uh, he said, we don't need them. We just need to focus on making the best show. We will find the right people to partner with. Um, but again, it's, it's inertia and entropy. It's people think we can only, because Latinos had success in West Side Story with a knife in their hand, they think we can only be on stage with a knife in our hand. That's the downside of that uh, show. And so, um, and so, you know, when we found, when we were lucky enough uh, to find uh, Kevin McCollum and Jill Furman and Jeffrey Seller, you know, they they believed in the story we were trying to tell, and then we were off to the races. What keeps you optimistic that this industry will be able to rebound? My little corner of the world that is theatre is older than all your corners. It was there before you. It will be there after the after the robots take over the movies. <laughs> we will still be telling each other stories in the dark as soon as we can safely gather. Um, honestly, I'm, what's, what's exciting about this, the moment is that I think in this conversation of systemic racism um, in our country, that's also, that conversation's also happening in the theater world. And I think the goal is not to return to business as usual. The goal is when Hamilton is back up and running, how can we begin to make inroads so that our backstage is as diverse as our onstage? And how can we begin to totally rethink um, how we sell our tickets to audience that our audience is as diverse as our onstage team? Um, that is uh, an important conversation and it's, an impor it's also an easy conversation to put to the side when you're doing eight shows a week and it's business as usual. Nothing is business as usual, so we're starting to have those conversations, and they're painful conversations, but they're necessary ones. So I'm encouraged by that. Um, what I've been doing to keep productive is, is reading and writing. One of the first books I read was uh, Will in the World, a biography of uh, uh, William Shakespeare, because I wanted to know what he really did when the plagues shut down the houses. I know the, 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 the trope on the internet is he wrote King Lear. It's not entirely accurate. He had to get his hustle on. He had to go find a patron. He had to write some sonnets. Um, and uh, I've been inspired by that. And I'm, I'm sort of reading about times when theater stopped. Um, that's, that's kind of, uh, and then continuing to work on the movie project. So I'm working on a project for Disney animation. Uh, I'm finishing up work on a animated musical for Sony animation. Um, so um, those deadlines also allow you to wall off uncertainty because you got a song due. <laughs>